Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to our Parents and Carers webinar. My name is Rosie McLennan. I'm the Group School Liaison Lead for the Inspire Education Group. Joining us tonight is Pippa Elderfield, who's the Assistant Head of Faculty for Early Years, Health and Social Care and Hospitality. Pippa will be covering T-Levels. Also, Phil Smith, our Group Manager for Student Recruitment and Financial Support, will be covering uh, application and enrolment and transport and finance. OK, so before I start, the following presentations have been carefully planned to help address the most frequently asked questions. We welcome any questions at the end of the presentations and would ask that you pop them into the chat. We'll also do um, our very best to sort of get through them. Um, if by any chance we're running a little bit short of time, um, then we definitely advise that you call um, our information advice and guidance teams. So for the Stanford one, that would be 01780 484311. Or for the Peterborough one, that would be 0345 872 8722. I will give those numbers out at the end um, if needs be. OK, so um, I'm going to basically present first and then Pippa will follow on from that. OK, so next slide, please. OK, so we are IEG, Inspire Education Group, um, formed in August 2020 um, following the merger of Peterborough Regional College, New College Stanford and University Centre Peterborough. OK. A vibrant and diverse community with over 10,000 um, students and 1,250 staff, I was told today, which is um, quite amazing. But it is really the most incredible atmosphere to work in. We really have created something incredible. No, OK, so the options are, are very straightforward in lots of ways. Um, your young people are going to be looking at doing um, for their post-16, they're either going to be looking at doing A-levels, T-levels, diplomas um, or apprenticeships. And during this um, presentation, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to give you some a little bit of support to help them make their decisions as to which pathways they want to choose. Okay. Our students are amazing. We are extremely proud of them. Um, when they first come through the doors of Stanford, they all do look extremely young and a little bit nervous. But actually, um, I think because, you know, we've got such excellent teams of staff, they are really, really supported. And all we want to do, we have one goal, and that is basically to make sure that when they leave us, they leave us towards going towards happy and successful careers. So this is um, uh, Natalie and basically she uh, was an A-level student and has recently managed to get um, an apprenticeship with a sports charity called Living Sport. Um, and reading through the lines, she really, really enjoyed doing her A-levels and it was extremely successful. OK, so this is Bella. Um, Bella is currently doing a T-level. Um, and basically has said that she's really looking forward to getting that hands-on experience, which I have to say for me is the sort of USP of a T-level. Um, Pippa is going to be talking in more detail, but I'm very excited about T-levels. I think they, you know, that they are an incredible opportunity for lots of young people because of the hands-on experience. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, Travis and a um, really, really lovely story, actually, because Travis never dreamt for one minute that he'd ever be looking at going to university. Um, and now that's, you know, that's clearly going to happen for him um, studying creative media production. Um, so really just the most incredible outcome. Fantastic. Uh, this is Thomas. So Thomas was recently presented with the Advanced Apprentice of the Year Award. Um, which is presented by um, Peterborough Telegraph. Um, and um, I think, you know, that is an incredible achievement. Doing an apprenticeship is, is, is actually quite tough in lots of ways. So, you know, again, um, a, an amazing achievement. Okay. 
So our staff, we are really, really proud of our staff. And um, I think probably, you know, because they all come from sort of industry. Uh, their knowledge is extraordinary. And the support that they give to our students is really, really good. And as I say, their whole goal is to make sure that, you know, your young people, when they leave, um, when they leave Stanford or Peterborough College, they've got a really good future to go to. So it might be that they're going into a job. It might be that they're going to university or an apprenticeship, whatever they're doing. But our staff are very focused on making sure that they're given as much support as is possible. And of course, they also have a great network themselves. So it's it's teamwork. OK, so the future of IG, um, well, I'm, as you can probably tell, very excited about it. I think um, we're going to go bigger and better. And I, you know, I, I know full well that our whole ethos on believing and we do that every young person deserves the chance to thrive, um, sort of creates this incredible sort of um, environment where people work as a team, where the students work with the um, teachers in order to do the very best that they can possibly do. Okay. Okay, so I'm briefly going to sort of go through this presentation on unlocking um, futures. And this is um, really for um, if your young person doesn't actually know what they want to do, or in brackets actually hasn't got a clue. I do know that feeling having had four boys and it's, it is actually quite stressful. Um, and having that chat with them obviously helps, you know, just discussing what their favourite subjects are, their interests, their goals, and in particular their sort of career aspirations, which um, is, you know, when you say to them, so what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself in five years time? Um, it, it just helps getting sort of things started. And I want to talk to you about our start program, which is embedded in our websites, which I think will help sort of mold um, th their whole focus. OK, so what um, it would be great if you did after this call or at some stages, go on to the Peterborough College or Stanford College websites um, and show them um, the start program. So basically, all you need to do is on, on both sites, actually, you go to the home, ba uh, home page um, and then you click on the tab uh, College Life, Careers Advice, and then just click on Start. And what they're going to do is literally sort of build themselves a little profile. It's very, very straightforward. But within that, they get all sorts of, you know, sort of personality um, uh, questionnaires like quizzes, and that will come up with lots of different types of careers that they could look at. Also, there's career matching and the sort of courses that they could look at doing. So it's just a really easy program to use. And once they built their profile, they can revisit their profile and then use it as they go, you know, as they progress through college. So it might be that, you know, they use it for job searching and how to write an application um, and also, you know, sort of um, personal statements for universities. But I'd highly recommend they do this. And I'm very much hoping that by the time they've done this, then they can look at, um, you know, what they're going to apply for. OK. So when you get to this stage, and I very much hope you do, um, they basically need to select a course. Um, and it is important to apply early. I don't want to sort of you know, stress you or anything, but it is important. Um, this year we've been oversubscribed and whilst we did our very best to get all of our students onto the courses they wanted, it wasn't necessarily easy. And for, especially for the young, you know, the, the, the people who sort of applied August time, it was very, very difficult. So we want to make sure that, you know, it's a good thing to apply early because actually what it does is it means that they know what they're doing and they can really focus on their GCSEs, which are absolutely crucial. Um, and, you know, and then they can sort of contact us anytime and, and talk it through. The other thing I was going to say is, you know, they are given their predicted grades from their schools and actually should be by now. If those we always encourage them to put the right grades down. There's no point. We want to know where they are because actually putting, you know, grades that are higher just means they're going to apply for a course that, you know, they're possibly going to be disappointed because they can't actually get onto it in the long term. The other thing is, of course, if they don't get their maths and English, um, they would have to apply for a level one or two course anyway. But we will help them with that. We'll help them get their maths and English if it's something they struggle with. 
OK, so just very quickly, A-levels, um, you know, they're theory and classroom based subjects. Um, they are recommended for those looking to study specialist subjects at universities such as medicine, um, dentistry, veterinary, etc. I would highly recommend that if you have, if your young person is looking at A-levels, we have an excellent A-level team, really, really good, and we get great results. But it's also very important that they understand all their options. So they understand that, you know, they could look at doing a T-level. Um, and they can certainly look at doing an extended level three diploma. So it's just important that they do explore. A levels aren't for everyone. Um, and, you know, there are occasions when some students have said to us, you know, I wish I'd done a level three diploma. Um, it, you know, it's sort of more vocational and at a steadier pace. But so I'm just saying, you know, again, encourage them to do their research. OK, diplomas are extremely popular. Um, a level three extended diploma is the equivalent to three A-levels um, and obviously carries UCAS points. It's accept they're accepted by 95 percent of universities and they certainly recognised by, you know, employers. Um, it's, they're very hands on, they're practical based subjects and they are designed to, uh, you know, to, to basically um, improve employability skills. T-levels, um, again, uh, Pippa is going to talk at length about T-levels, um, but they are equivalent to three A-levels and again, carry UCAS points. They are relatively new, um, but, that, um, you know, we're very, very excited about them. And um, I would urge, you know, as I would urge people to look at a T-level, but Pippa will give you more information on this. OK. OK, apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are um, becoming more and more competitive. There seems to be less uh, apprenticeships around. Having said all that, you know, getting an apprenticeship is, um, you know, a fantastic thing to do. It's great experience. Um, but I would definitely recommend that, you know, you, they throw the net wide. They apply to a lot of local businesses for an apprenticeship and they make sure it's a kind of well-written application um, because, you know, at, having spelling mistakes etc and bad grammar in it is not going to help the application we have two fantastic um, apprenticeship teams that i think i've mentioned and they'll be more than happy um, to advise but we don't get we don't find that apprenticeship for you so they will have to find their own apprenticeships we do i speak to lots of students um, on a daily basis and some students are lucky enough to have family members who you know have offered them an apprenticeship which is great um, others basically have got to find their own but we'll do what we can to help okay okay so um that is the end of of, of my presentation and um thank you very much and as i said if you've got any questions just pop them in the chat and then we'll address everything at the end i'm going to hand you over to pippa now thank you no problem right i'll just share my slides so you can see them it's just two seconds There we go. Can we see those? OK, Rosie? Yeah. Yep. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, OK, so I'll just go through um, T-levels in detail. So kind of give you an overview of what they are and what they consist of. Um, as Rosie said, I, I look after early years, health and social care um, and catering and hospitality mainly. But this is T-levels in general. So um, I won't be able to answer questions about subject specifics, but it gives you a good idea. And they are, um, you know, the same kind of setup across every single subject. Um, but I've given you some examples throughout as well. So T-levels, what are they? So they're a common framework. So as I said, they're the, you know, they've got a similar setup across every single subject. So no matter which subject the um, your child is choosing, um, it will have the same setup in terms of kind of the types of assessments that they're doing and um, the elements that, um, the core elements and skills that they're learning. It will just be um, specific to the subject that they've chosen and the industry that they're kind of, or the sector they're wanting to go into. The biggest change um, with T-levels in comparison to our level three um, diplomas and extended diplomas, et cetera, is that um, T-levels require, require students to do a high quality industry placement. Um, so it's not your standard work experience um, where it's quite separate from their main course. Um, it is a high quality industry placement. We do work in partnership um, with the employers and I'll go into a little bit more detail about the industry placement in a second. Uh, T-levels are employer designed. So um they have had boards of employers 
designing these alongside awarding bodies. So the idea is that the T level in the sector that your uh, child has chosen will be relevant to today's um, working life. So whereas some of our level three programmes were maybe created a long time ago, um, the T levels do take into consideration kind of the changes in workforce now and things like the use of um, IT. So how technology has changed workforces in different sectors. Um, there is a digital element to the T levels and making sure that's embedded with that within all of the programmes. Um, and they are a two year programme as well, so similar to A levels in that way. The idea is with this reform by putting the T levels in is to kind of streamline the offer that there is to students. Um, the current level three offer, depending on which subject, has lots of different um, qualifications as BTECs, technical certificates, MVQs, extended diploma. The idea is that actually it will streamline what that means for students. So it's either, a, you know, it would be a T level for a level three qualification rather than all these different um, kind of names for what is essentially the same thing. OK, so it's a bit of a big shift when we're thinking about um, what we've traditionally offered in terms of vocational programmes. Um, but the main part of this is really that Im implementation of industry placement and making sure that actually the students are work ready and that we are preparing them. So there's an idea around here that it is a talent pipeline, um, getting students ready to go out into a workforce that they want to work in, uh, whether that's that they have to go to university after the course or whether it's going straight out into employment, depending on the subject. It is equivalent to three A-levels and it accrues UCAS points as well. So I've quickly put those on there for you and Rosie mentioned UCAS points so you could see them. Um, it's your traditional distinction merit pass um, and it got, it's got the UCAS points on there. From my um, knowledge in early years, health and social care, we'd be looking at students getting a merit to get your traditional kind of primary teaching um, degrees at university. Um, adult nursing degrees, those sorts of things would be around a merit is what they'd be looking for on a T level. So what does it look like? It's made up of two kind of main components. So you've got the core component of a T level and then you've got the specialist skills, the so kind of the specialism that they want to um, do within that core. There are three main assessments on every single T level. So there are exams for the core. So you have a core A and a core B. Um, then there are some practical assessments that are made up of a range of tasks. There's an employer set project and there is an occupational specialism. Um, and these are made up of lots of different things. Um, there may be written tasks that are done under exam conditions, but there will also be kind of peer discussions and group presentations. So if, for example, a student is not as confident in their writing, they'll also get the opportunity to kind of express their ideas through speaking and listening. So it gives a good range of opportunity for the student to kind of achieve those assessments as well. And um, industry placements, this is a holistic approach between um, the placement, the um, provider, so us as a college and the curriculum team, and also the student themselves as well. So in finding industry placements, we have work experience teams on site, so they are um, making links with employers. Um, and we are inviting employers to work with us with on these qualifications. And so far, it's been quite positive. Employers are wanting to work with us to make sure that students are work ready for their area. But there is a kind of, you know, there is some expectation of the student as well. If we just hand the student a placement, it's, you know, they're not going to maybe value it as much if they've kind of worked and made sure they've chose the right um, placement for them. So we're treating it very much like a job application, especially in early years, health and social care. Um, Early years, for example, they could end up in lots of different types of nurseries. Um, we want them to apply for them and think about what skills they've got and why they want to work in that particular nursery. Is it just because it's close to them or is it because they really like the way that they um, they work in, in general or they like being outside with the children? I always use the example that if you don't like being outside and you've chosen a nursery um, that spend their whole time outside, you're not going to have a very enjoyable two years um, playing in the mud and sand and water and all of that sort of thing. Um, it might be that they prefer a nursery that's more school and structured um, and it's really important that they're actually in the right placement because two years is not um, is a long period of time. As, as parents yourselves you wouldn't choose a job just based on where it is, you'd want to feel that it was the right place for you. We can offer in-house placements as well for learners that have SEND or, or additional needs um, and we can use 105 of these hours to um, transition them into employability. So if you're concerned about your 
child's um, employability skills and their ability to hold down a work placement, we can make adjustments to ensure that they are work ready and we shouldn't be sending them out until they're work ready as well. We have to do a lot of work in college before they go out onto placement to make sure that we are um, helping them to achieve. And we are encouraging employers to inform curriculum. They are coming in, they're working with us and we speak to them regularly about what we're teaching and they're speaking to us about what they're finding in placement as well um, to make sure that we're plugging those gaps and it really is a whole approach. It's no longer two separate entities um, the curriculum team work with the employers rather than they're just going off to work experience for two weeks. That's um, absolutely not how it is now. But the important message here is that it is mandatory. Um, they cannot achieve their qualifications without the hours. So it's really important that um, if they're signing up to a T level, they know they are going to have to work uh, in an industry placement. And every single T level has 315 hours minimum. Now, I've put some models of delivery here to give you an idea of what the industry placement could look like um, but it is unique to each specific T level so depending on the subject um, education and early years will always be two at two days per week plus block weeks throughout the entire two years because they are in uh, they do need to get 750 hours to ensure a license to practice um, other areas might do block weeks they might do one day per week they might focus at the end of the two years if they need to learn lots before they go out onto industry placement but they're also expected to follow the industry norm. So, for example, catering and hospitality, it would be evening and weekends that they would be working for their industry placement. However, they can include part time jobs. So if they're already working in the sector, you can include that as long as their employer is happy to work with us and ensure that they're getting the opportunities that they require in their placement. So this is just an example of what a T level looks like. So. Um, the route for this T level is health and science. The T level is health. There is also it would also uh, branch off to science as well. But I've just chosen um, health today as an example. And the core A and B exams and the employer set project is what makes up that T level. So that's the assessment for the actual T level. So it doesn't matter which specialism they are doing. They will all do the same core and ESP. And then they'll also have an occupational specialism assessment, which will be practical as well that relates specifically to what they've chosen. So that would be different for both dental nursing and supporting healthcare. Supporting healthcare is quite unique because then it has a choice of five further routes, such as adult nursing, um, supporting therapy teams, mental health, and lots of other things like that. So the students can um, start to kind of drill down into what they want, the area that they want to work into. And finally, it's just an example of some of the things that they might learn whilst they're on a T level. So this is an early years example. Um, you've got your core knowledge, which is in the exams. So that's kind of your theory content, um, the stuff that they really need to know in that sector. Um, you've then got core skills for the employer set project. So you can see in there you've also got communication, working with others. It's not always just theory things. It's actually showing that they can um, do speaking and listening, um, engaging with people as well. And then you've got the performance outcomes as well. So kind of their competencies and their specialism, how um, they can actually meet the job requirements and also these things cross um, a crossover. So what we're teaching in the core also happens in the occupational specialism and why it's so important to work with providers, uh, employers and what we're doing in college as well. I think that's it for me. Um, any questions, obviously pop them in the chat and we'll answer those at the end. OK, OK, <clears throat> thanks, Pippa. That's absolutely great. OK, I'm going to hand you over to Phil now. Are you there, Phil? Yes, I am. Bear me Excellent. two seconds. I'm just going to get the uh, the website up and open. Can you see that OK, Rosie? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Phil. I'm the group manager for um, student recruitment and admissions. So I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour around sort of how to choose a subject, how to navigate the website, where all the support information is and where all the transport stuff is and and things like that. But as Rosie said, if you have any questions, if we don't have time to answer them, all the contact details are on both of the Stanford and the Peterborough websites. And my team are absolutely brilliant, super, super knowledgeable, and they'll be more than willing to help you uh, through any sort of questions that you might have. Um, so to start with, I'm just going to use the Stanford website. Um, it's the one that I had open and it's the one that I'm most familiar with. So but they're, they're both websites are set up very, very similarly. The same information is on both. It's just the, the buttons here or there might just look a bit different. So the key areas on the Stanford website are the study area and the college life area. 
that is pretty much all a prospective student or prospective applicant or parent. Uh, that is all you'll need. They're the two sections. So on the study tab, we've got all the different filters. So you can actually filter by the type of qualification as Rosie and Pippa have just gone through. Um, or you can filter by subject and there's a nice little handy how to apply bit as well. So just on there, the, the bits that I am going to cover are kind of the easy bits because the applying bit's dead easy, the enrollment bit's dead easy, the financial support and transport bit is usually dead easy. It's the choosing <laughs> the subject for the young people is usually the more challenging part of it. So that is in the college um, life section under our careers and vice service. And if you just pop a click in there, click that big link there and that'll take you straight to the page if you need it. And it is really useful. And it's quite good, actually. I, I completed it after I left teaching and it recommended me to be a teacher. So it's pretty accurate, I think. So in the study tab. So, for example, I'm just going to run a run through a scenario. So if I wanted to, let's say, uh, apply for a level three business course, um, I'm going to click on subject areas. And then I'm going to find all of the subject areas are in here. I know I've gone past business just now. Um, but they're all in there. So you can kind of navigate your search a little bit by discipline if you wanted to, or again by qualification type. So here's the business section. Uh, there's a message from the head of department there. Uh, one thing that I will say that I always stop at this bit is the virtual tour. If you can't get in to do an open day or a taster day or something like that, I would really, really recommend. I genuinely think I'm not just saying it because I work at Inspire Education Group. I just think this is an amazing tool and you can literally go everywhere into all the classrooms, um, all the main spaces in the college. So here's our nice bistro with our Starbucks at the back. Um, it's, it's a really, really useful tool if you just don't or can't make an open evening or, you know, just don't want to come in for it. You don't have to. So you've got the information there. But if we keep scrolling down, here are all our business courses there. Some areas you can expand the list because there's more than what we'll just show in the first section. But we're going to go for um, a level three business there. And on the main qualification pages, it will give you everything you need to know uh, in terms of a snapshot around the course. So a bit of a, a summary of what the course is, the entry requirements there in terms of what you need, future potential career pathways and the course content. So this might be particularly interesting if you are sort of weighing up between the A level, the T levels or the B tech in terms of the content, particularly for business, because you'll be able to do business on all of those disciplines, it might be worth looking at these kind of course content units to see if, you know, the units there, because the BTEC tends to be, if, if it's three level equivalent of business, it's pure three A levels worth of business. Um, so rather than sort of a blend of subjects. So the, the BTEC will tend to go into a little bit more detail in that sense, but obviously it doesn't give you the flexibility that perhaps an A level would have been able to pick different subjects and do them at the same time. Um, so then basically scroll down to the subject page, hit apply, and then you're straight into the application form there. So it's as easy as that, really. Once you're in the application, I'll just sort of see you through the first page um, because obviously it won't let me progress until I fill all my details in. And I don't really, really want to do that on a, on a big conference call. But yeah, so you pop in your personal details, but it's really this following the bouncing ball at the top of the page there. And once you've completed, it will be um, a submit button at the end. And then you've applied. One thing that I will just say is that sometimes young people do uh, want to apply, but there's a there, there's a misconception, the fact that if they declare any support needs or SEN needs that they've had at school, that it's going to they think it's going to impact their ap application where I'm just wanting to reassure you that it absolutely doesn't. Um, basically, the reason we get that information is so that we can make sure that this, we can put the support in place to allow all our students to succeed at the same way. So please discourage anyone from doing that. I know it's kind of that misconception is quite common. I always just have to touch on it because there's examples every single year um, where, you know, we have a student that had exam access arrangements at school and uh, it comes to exam time and it comes out the woodwork the week before the exams or something like that. So please disclose it. My admissions team, the main thing that we look for is predicted grades or achieved grades or target grades, plus the personal statement. In some areas, my admissions team won't even make the decision 
um, it will be down to um, there'll be a, a need for prior learning. So, for example, if you um, applying for a music technology uh, performance course, sorry, obviously, and you can't play an instrument or you can't sing, that's going to make that course pretty challenging. So there is an audition for that course. So once you've applied, if we just nip back into this how to apply section, there is this really handy what happens next guide. So again, we're talking uh, like a, um, a follow the bouncing ball uh, step by step. So what we've just done now is submitted an application. We have done our audition for music performance and we've established that I'm a fantastic singer and I can get on the course. So I've had my offer at that point and then I might do a meet the tutor depending on what the course is. Every student will be invited to a meet the tutor event where it will be similar sort of content to this, but it will be more directed to the course. So I would definitely uh, recommend that once your offer comes through that your young people attend those. Likewise, with the Taste Today, all of our accepted offers will be um, invited to Taste Today. And I would just stress, please do, once we you have an offer made, please accept or decline that offer um, as quickly as you can, because we filled up very, very quickly this year. It's really, really important if you can spend in as much time as you can at this stage to go and have a look at our college, Peterborough, other colleges, schools, if it's very difficult to make the right decision if you don't know everything that's out there. So that is the, my biggest bit of advice at this point. So some courses will also have a summer assignment um, as part of the onboarding process as well. And then we've applied, so we're into enrollment now. So there are a couple of stages as part of this, so all of the financial support, the transport side of things and the enrolment process itself, um, because transport's obviously going to be pretty important because, you know, it's no point, in, I guess, looking at our courses if you know you can't get here. Um, so again, it's in our college life section. There is a big transport section there. So and what we've got is um, a really cool tool, another cool tool that uh, my colleagues Chris and Rosie have uh, put on the website for us here is our uh, is our brilliant postcode picker. So what you can actually do is pop in um, your home postcode and our postcode picker will find you the nearest route um, to your house. And then actually you can Google map it and it tells you how far the walk is from your house to the bus stop. Now, which is super brilliant, but one thing that I will say, it only has the buses that we put on, on this. So it will not bring in public service routes and things like this. So for the example that I've just put on, I put in a market deeping postcode, and actually you wouldn't walk to Northborough to catch a bus to the college. What you would do is jump on the Delane bus, which would give you far more flexibility uh, to get in and out of um, Stamford from there as well. So just a bit of wor word of warning there. But everything we have in terms of transport is in our transport guide there. So you can click on that and it'll download that for you. And basically there's a little indices at the front, which you pick your area and the little number next to it will give you the route. So let's just say I'm in Langtoft. So I can see that that's a route eight. So I'll go down to the route eight service and then the Langtoft stop to Peterborough College is at eight past eight in the morning on the A15 bus stop. And that will bring me straight to the college doorstep. So it's as easy as that, really, where transport is concerned. The cost of transport, what I will say, the stated costs are what we are charging this year. They are likely to change, uh, as with everything, next year. But we do offer a very, very comprehensive um, financial support offer, uh, which if you're eligible for, um, you know, students will get uh, a large contribution of their uh, bus pass pay for if they're eligible or even the whole thing um, and where financial support is concerned sorry Rosie I'm speaking quickly because I'm just conscious of time <laughs> no you, <laughs> you're, you're doing fine you're okay, okay. thank you so our <laughs> finance and funding page so the best way to go here it's very complicated well this part of it is because it covers all the HE fees and things like this but for most of our applicants the quickest way to get the information about financial support is to go right down to the bottom of the page and use our financial support guide here. So 
This guide is a downloadable one. I will have them available at Open Days hard copies if you want to come in and grab one at the next Open Day, you're more than welcome to. Um, it outlines all of the bursary um, and financial support uh, that we offer, including our, th our, th our thresholds as well. So basically the key thing that I would say to everybody is pick the pathway that you want in for any young people then worry about the cost afterwards because if you are our, 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 our financial th support threshold goes up to forty thousand pounds per year and that is income so we we're pretty much discounting every single benefit so on a universal credit statement for example if there is a line that says income on it that's what we count so we don't count anything else so it's quite a comprehensive offer um, and the thresholds are below. So basically, if the earned income, uh, excluding all benefits, is under the 16190 threshold, everything is paid for anyway. Uh, if it's under £40,000, the only thing we ask is a, is a contribution towards the, the bus pass if you need it. Whereas kit and equipment, because I'm very aware that the hair and beauty kit is very, very expensive. Um, but like I say, if you fall under the financial support thresholds, we will buy that all for you. So you don't need to worry. Pick the pathway that you want to do it and then we will help you from there. So in terms of applying and enrolling, all of the links to apply for financial support are sent out to you. I'm just going to go back to a little bit there prior to enrolment. So enrolment will typically start on GCSE results day. Um, at the towards the end of August and we will send out transport applications and bursary applications before we break up for the summer holidays um, so you will have plenty of time to kind of put your applications in um, get the bus pass sorted get get the payments made if you need to and we can do that well in advance of the term start excuse me um, so you, you literally all set and sorted. You'll also in that email that asks you to apply for um, the bursary and transport, you will get a pre-enrolment form. So basically what that is, is just confirming everything that was on the application is still current and correct. Um, any additional information like so we'll be talking actual grades at that point rather than predicted grades or target grades. And then the enrollment, it will have your enrollment date on there as well. And the enrollment will basically be done in about half an hour, 45 minutes. You bring your certificates in um, and basically you speak to your tutors, you formally enroll onto the course and then you collect your ID badge and then you're officially a Stanford or Peterborough or UCP student at that point. OK, thank you so much, everyone. I'm just going to stop sharing quickly now. And hand you back to Rosie. Excellent. That was great. Thank you so much, Pippa. Thank you so much, Phil. OK, um, I'm going to just check the chat. Um, and like I say, if anyone's got any questions, now is the time to ask. Quick check. Okay. Give it a few minutes. OK, I'm going to give it a little bit of time because we don't seem to have got any questions in. Um, Okay, yeah. Ah, what's the deadline for applying, Phil? Okay, deadline for applying, there isn't one in short. However, our courses after this year, we've just had our record numbers of student enrollment. So I would say the sooner the better, but likewise with, with young people, they can change their mind at the very last minute. And even after we start a course, we have a small window at the start of the year and um, that small window will be a transfer window. So providing there is space on uh, alternative courses, students will still be able to apply late at that point and swap into other courses. But I would a word of caution against that. Our courses um, fill up very, very quickly. And so the flexibility to be able to do that is is kind of diminishing year on year. So I would definitely make sure that we know what we're doing well in advance. So let me just have a look at these other ones. I've applied for A-levels at my sick form. Um, then it gets raised. What it? Yes, you can do. Um, you absolutely you can. If you're if we are your first choice, that's absolutely fine. So your college might be the first choice. Um, school might be your first choice. 
you can apply to us as well. And when we make you the offer, actually what we do is we say, are we your first choice or second choice? That doesn't also doesn't affect whether your offer is there or not. Uh, it just helps us with curriculum planning a little bit. Um, so absolutely apply to us. If it is your backup, that's totally fine as well. Uh, let's have a look. Chris, can you apply for more of one course? Unfortunately not at the moment. Um, but what you can do is change your application at any point. So if you come, if you let's say applied for the business level three course, you came to an open evening, you got your offer, did you meet the tutor, and then had second thoughts and you wanted to do plumbing or something like that, you all it's just one quick call to the admissions team and they will swap your application over, re-interview for you for the plumbing or invite you to the meet the tutor and the taste today, and then you're a plumbing applicant as of that point. Okay. Sorry, oh, Dave, Donna. Um, can you tell me when the interviews will be likely to start, please? You missed that one, Phil. Oh, sorry, that's January. Yeah. Yep, they'll be starting in January, all the Meet the Tutors. Some courses like to get an early start on it. So there's some A-levels and some creative arts ones going on now. The A-level ones and creative arts ones usually are online um, and you usually won't see them through um, through the meet, in the Meet the Tutor events. Uh, but things kind of do change and we've still got until January to kind of uh, set the format and things like that there. Uh, if a student goes to get the grades on level three, yeah, typically, Michelle, yes, they would do. Uh, we will do everything we can to try and place every single student. So and it is and it is, you know, it does happen. We don't like it. We'd love everyone to get eights and nines in English and maths. But sometimes there's a, a grade shy or something like that, of the entry requirements. Again, it depends on the whole picture. So the tutor and the enrollment period, if you've got nines for everything, for example, and a three in English, and it's a very maths based, practical driven course, I don't think there'd be any objections to progression there as long as there was the ability to, to bolt on the English retake at that same point. So it's individualized in that, um, in that sense. And I think okay. that's T levels there. Okay, Pippa. Okay, yeah. so a couple of <laughs> definitely one for you, Pippa. Yeah, there's one here about industry placement for computing and IT. Um, you know, we are still working towards. We've only just started our T level journey. There's lots of work towards working with other companies. Um, I think for that one, I'll have to pass it over to the um, head of faculty for that area. But um, you know, it is a holistic approach. We do need to support students and make sure they have placements, and it is a requirement of the course. So um, I understand your concern there, but I think that's what I'm going to have to pass on for you. If you want to email in as well, Lisa, we can make sure we get back to you um, about that specific um, situation as well. Um, Kate asking about, do universities accept T levels? Um, yes, they do. Now, it's really important if your child has a specific career. So for example, if they wanted to be a doctor, um, if you were to look at university entry requirements, they would be asking for specific A levels. Um, they, that course, for example, would not accept a T level. So um, if you kind of know what they want to do in the future, it's definitely worth having a look at what the university entry requirements are just in case. Um, most, I'm just thinking about health in general, but most of them are OK in terms of um, things like paramedic science, nursing. Um, you know, we have worked in partnership with employers or the uh, warning bodies have, so they are recognised qualifications. Um, so let's put that grades necessary. That's on the website, isn't it, Phil, for every, each course of entry requirements? Um, yeah, so there is an yeah. option if you have no grades. Obviously, that will mean that you're automatically looking at sort of entry level and level one courses, uh, but that's not a problem at all. There is no set amount for our courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's one here about uh, is this session being recorded? So can I um, show my son later? Uh, yes, it is being recorded um, and we can send a link out to the recording to everybody who attended. So that's fine. Yeah. One here about um, not reaching grades for level three. Do you need to apply for level two as a backup? That's not necessarily enrolment, um, especially in early years, health and social care and lots of other areas as well. Um, if you apply for level three and you don't get maths, for example, we would automatically enroll you onto the right level. So it's more about the subject. Um, and making sure you're applying as closely to predicted grades as possible. But if things went wrong um, during the exams, we would absolutely make sure we can get you a space in those um, on those levels. OK, and there's another here. Uh, hello, what grades necessary to apply? Um, 
I mean, basically, you know, you've got all levels. So, Phil, do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah, it's course dependent, completely course dependent. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, typically a level three course will be five fives. Um, and then uh, level twos, four fours. And level ones, sort of any entry requirement, depending what the course is. So, brickwork, for example, at level one doesn't have any formal entry requ requirements. Um, but, like I say, it's purely course dependent. So to get onto our university courses at UCP, you'll obviously need a level three uh, and the equivalent UCAS points to get on there. So your best bet is to look on the website then for, and, what, and see all the entry requirements per course for what you might be after. And are interviews online or in person? Oh yeah, I think we did that one. A little bit of both. Done it, Again, sorry. Depending okay. on what course you're on. Right, fine. Um, uh, interviews for every subject course or just specific ones? Yeah, it does depend on the curriculum area. As I said before, music performance, there has to be an element of prior sort of level of learning for that course. Um, but again, as I said, I use the brickwork example again. Um, there isn't there isn't any there. So let's have a look. Someone's apprenticeship with OpenReach. Ah, yes. Yeah. So with apprenticeships, that's what I didn't cover, actually. So on the website where it was in the um, in the study tab, there is an apprenticeships bit. So for the apprenticeship uh, applications, because there's a lot, it depends on the placement. So OpenReach would be brilliant. Um, basically, yeah. it's just a case of filling an inquiry form in on our apprenticeship page. So under every apprenticeship, uh, there is an inquiry form that you click on, the same as the application form. You fill that in and one of our apprenticeship team will give you a call to start the ball rolling because apprenticeships are often roll on, roll off. So they're not pinned to September start dates either. OK, um, is there a list of open days to visit each college? Yes, there is. Um, those will be on our websites. But also, if you wanted to pop into either college, you could pick up a mini perspective guide. And in the back of it, it's got all of the open days as well. I've got the next dates, if that's helpful, Rosie. OK, yeah, fantastic. Uh, Peterborough is Wednesday, the 17th of January. And Stamford okay. is Wednesday, the 24th of January. So the next ones are in January. Fantastic. And also, it's always a good idea to register for those open days. Um, it just makes basically it just means you get through quicker. That's all. It's a bit like going to an airport when you haven't checked in. Um, so it's a good idea to register. Uh, do you have enough copies on board to cover work placements in IT for T levels or attending the course? Um, again, I think they mean companies. Yeah. Companies, yeah. That's not. That's not an area that I specifically work with, so I'd have to get back to that area and get them to pass that information on to you because um, they're not part of my specific sector, unfortunately. Um, but I can find out for you and we can get that information sent to you. Yeah, OK, brilliant. That's fantastic. Well, I think there's one from um, Nigel there about progression there that we've just missed. So in terms of progression, um, it's not automatic. So. As I say, some level three requirements, uh, level three courses have um, entry requirements in. So, for example, if if a young person doesn't get their maths and English in the retake, um, it might be um, part of the entry requirements for the level three. If it's a T level or an A level, they want to swap to. But ideally, that's exactly how we would want to do it. So we would want to see a student go from level one to two to three, then to UCP. So, yeah, that's definitely something that we try and encourage and make happen wherever we can. But obviously we don't want to put anyone. We want to put the right students on the right course and not set up, put anyone on a course that's too tough or likewise too easy. So there'll be a little bit of jigging around at the start of the year as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, OK, can anyone see any we've, we've missed or? Oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's one. How do you apply? Oh, here we go. Yeah, you, there's, you, you can apply if you don't have your predicted grades, because yeah. if you have target grades, that would be enough. Um, that'd be absolutely fine. You can always give us a call and amend those target grades and amend your application at any point before the start of the year. So last school report would probably be fine. 
or you know you could hold off until the mock exam the results and the next report comes in and that's more predicted grade than a target grade so obviously the closer to the GCSE exams that you get the more accurate in theory those predictions should be but I could tell yeah. that my predicted <laughs> grades were a little bit off my actual grades so we appreciate that there can be some uh, some changes there <laughs> Okay. I just have to add to the IT one because I know there's some concern around the IT placements. Um, what I do know about IT placements is it doesn't have to be an IT company, so it can be a company that just uses um, a significant amount of IT as well. So, for example, in the NHS, they obviously have IT departments. So, um, in terms of companies, it doesn't have to be an IT department. It can be a company that uses IT within their running, their day-to-day -day running. So, I just want to put some reassurance there. But I'll definitely go back to the IT um, department and get them to give a more comprehensive answer okay okay yeah that's brilliant um do we have any more questions i think we're in, oh, thank thank yous lots of thank yous that's great <laughs> um okay i just had a thought that you know if after you um come off this webinar and you suddenly think oh i should have asked this i should have asked that you can always email um our inquiries at phil just remind me it's inquiries at Stanford.ac.uk. Right. OK, so send, yeah. And if you put it for the attention of Rosie McLennan, then I can basically send it to whoever can answer the question or I'll answer it myself. But um, OK, uh, hang Do on a minute. Sorry, do you have the email addresses as part of this? Just Don, as I was asking again, um, will we be updated? Have we got email? If not, Don, if you want to email into the inquiries and put about the attention of this webinar, then we can get back to you um, on that yeah. IT query. Definitely. Yeah, and if predicted grades are low, yeah, you definitely still can apply. I see that Phil's put that as well. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Look, this has been really good, and I hope you found it extremely helpful. Thank you so much, Pippa. Thank you so much, Phil. Oh, hang on a minute. What if you're on holiday on enrolment day? Just need to let us know before. So don't yeah. go on holiday and then ring us after your enrolment time and tell us then. Let us know beforehand. But as I say, you know, I can't stop anyone going on holiday, but obviously it's it's <laughs> easy for everyone if people don't, but I totally understand that. Just make sure that we're informed when you get your enrolment invite that you're not going to be there for enrolment and we will ring fence that place for you, providing the entry requirements are there, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. OK, and and also, you know, if you don't want to email, you'd rather call, then just call our information advice and guidance team on 01780 484 311. And um, as Phil said, he has a fantastic team and they will be able to help you with everything. I think we're just about done. OK, brilliant. OK, so thank you very, very much indeed, everyone. Uh, it's really, really fantastic webinar and um, huge thanks to Phil and Pippa. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Chris. Thank thanks, you. Pippa. See you later. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, bye, bye.